Good evening, everybody. How's the mic going? Is that all right? Not on me. Somebody else can worry about that. Can you bow your heads with me? I just want to start tonight uh, my session in prayer. Maybe by then somebody will throw me a microphone, but I love to yell anyway. I want to, in fact, pray words that God himself wrote from the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Please close your eyes with me. Lord, risen Jesus Christ, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. Lord God, you know that we have none. But because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. We pray this in the name of our mediator, our living redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. it is Daniel's prayer to God, considering the desolations of the Old Testament city of God, Zion or Jerusalem, that has inspired what should be our prayer for the living uh, temple of God in the world today, the church of Jesus Christ. We cry out to him, we are in a desolate state and we need God to look, to hear, to pay attention and to act. The lot falls to me tonight to introduce our theme and speak something of our aim at this conference as a whole. Our, our, our theme in general is to study true, biblical, robust, evangelical revival and therefore to stand firm on those things which scripture tells us God uses to bring about revival. That's our theme. What is revival and how ought we to stand firm on things that God uses to bring it about? Our aim therefore, that is by the end of this conference, we want to be sending sinners home. This is our first aim. We want to be sending sinners home, people who came here out of covenant with Jesus Christ. We want to send you back home in covenant with Jesus Christ. People who came here as sinners under the law's condemnation and guilt, we want and we pray by God's help to send you home as justified souls where you were dead before, you're alive now. Where you had an old, sinful, filthy heart. We want to send you home with a new heart. The heart that only Jesus' Spirit can give you by the preaching of the gospel. We want to send sinners home justified and in a forgiven union relationship with Jesus Christ this weekend. That's our first aim, true individual revival of souls. Jesus is now present to save as he is whenever his word is preached, whenever his people gather, and he calls you, if you are not a born-again Christian, if you do not have peace in your conscience between you and God, if the law still terrifies you and hell still makes you tremble, then for you, Jesus is present right now to heal your soul and give you eternal life. Our second aim is to send Christians home revived. That is that we hope you have a sense, both through the stories you hear, through the, the preaching of the word that you're attentive to, we hope that you're getting sent home awake to your previous sleepiness, awake to the, the kind of drowsiness we were tolerating before, and that of the drowsiness of the church more generally. I want to send you home burning with desire, and this has been my prayer, burning with desire to see Jesus magnified in ways not presently imaginable. That is, I want you to go home expectant that if you can imagine it happening, that's too short and you want Jesus to do something bigger. I want to send you home repenting of sins, devoting yourself to the Great Commission, hungry to be of use to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to send Christian leaders, people in ministry, especially pastors, and I do know that there are some in our midst tonight, we want to send Christian leaders home challenged and equipped. 
casting off unbiblical practices, forsaking human means in ministry to receive the fruit that only God can give, and seeking a supernatural ministry with supernatural results by the power of the gospel. That's what we're trying to do. This weekend, to be in some measure, a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the Lord. Repent, church, for the kingdom of God is at hand and has been for a long time. So let's start with this. What is revival? I'm going to feel free to be plenty brief because Craig has a whole session next on what is revival. So I won't steal his thunder, although he has enough lightning to provide plenty of his own thunder. But I will be brief here. Uh, uh, He'll be making the biblical case. Let me first start, though, because I know that a lot of us are from Hope. Some of others will be from some of the other Reformed Baptist churches. Some others of you, though, will be from different backgrounds, different churches. Maybe you're new to the faith. Maybe revival, this is the first time you've ever even sort of considered at length what revival is. So let me start with some theological assumptions that I and the speakers here over this weekend are going to assume to everything we say about revival, lest there be any confusion. First, the first theological assumption of this entire weekend as we speak about revival is the utter and absolute sovereignty of God. Amen? Amen. If you didn't amen that, I'm glad you're here, but we're going to get you. Utter and absolute sovereignty of God over both history and individual salvation. So the London Baptist Confession of Faith puts it the best. They summarize scripture the best, I believe, when they say, God has decreed in himself from eternity past by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, everything that will ever come to pass. God has ordained and planned everything that happens. He doesn't watch it unfold and then sometimes spark up revival. Everything that occurs in this world is by God's sovereign design. And they say that simply to echo Ephesians 1.1 where the Apostle Paul says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. God is sovereign over history. God is also sovereign over individual salvation. Let me say this. Uh, 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 Let me just read read, uh, London Baptist Confession chapter 10, which says, those who God has predestined to life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call to life by his word and by his spirit. He calls them out of that state of sin and death in which everyone is by nature. And he calls them to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh. And this they say simply in reflection of John 3 where Jesus said, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. God is sovereign over each person saved. Here's our second assumption theologically in this weekend. The exclusivity and the absolute certainty of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. All right. This is... This is one of the big ones. If you're going to amen anything, that's where you get, you, you know, you get brownie points and I'll give you some of my uh, uh, golden tiles in heaven if you amen this one really loud. Uh, Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among, by, among men by which we must be saved. Therefore, we believe in the exclusivity and the certainty of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Thank you. Bless you. It's encouraging hearing that. All who call on the name of the Lord, Peter said, will be saved. Souls go to heaven only by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's essential to revival. Here's a third essential element. The necessity of the Holy Spirit in salvation and in Christian ministry. That is that all of the blessings that God the Father gives through the Son to His church, He sends them to us by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is not that Jesus gives salvation and Jesus gives us heaven, but while we're here, the Holy Spirit does this other thing and it's really fun, it's very noisy, and it's really exciting. No, 
The Holy Spirit's job is to point to Jesus and he's essential in the uplifting of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 16 to his disciples, it's good for you that I go away. For I do not, for if I do go away, the helper will come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Further on, he says, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine. Therefore, I said that the spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. How Trinitarian. Everything the father wants to give to his church comes through the gifting of his son by the work of the Holy Spirit, including salvation. Number five, uh, no, sorry, number four, I skipped one. We believe in the perpetually binding rule of the Great Commission on the church. The perpetually binding rule of the Great Commission on the church. Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of this age. That means that every age, every generation, every denomination, despite any state of the world, our injunction always from heaven is to preach, evangelize, baptize, disciple, and then plant churches that do the same thing until Jesus comes back. Fifthly, states of revival are to be sought regardless of your end times view. We might have... We might have Maybe some people in here tonight who heard revival conferences on and rolled up all of their end times material and raced here in hope that that's what this is all about, in either argument against it or in support for this theme, I want to say this, regardless of your view of eschatology, it will influence your view of history and it will influence your view of the state of the church, especially as history comes to a close. Also, your view of revivals will very likely influence which eschatology you, you land on. But all sound views of the end times, that is all within the orthodox biblical spectrum, and there's plenty, all sound views of the end times allow for revivals to occur, small or large, at any point in history up until Jesus Christ comes back. If on that point you say no, there will be a period when the Spirit's work in the world will cease and he will stop adding people into the church of Jesus Christ, you need to read your New Testament again. So wherever we are at in our view of the end times, that, that's not this conference. It's not a, a narrow-minded conference. The speakers aren't even a narrow-minded bunch. Well, we're narrow-minded, but on this we're pretty, we're, we're a bit of uh, uh, all across the, the spectrum. So... Revivals can happen at any point in history up until Jesus comes back, small or large. Therefore, these, these assumptions are Trinitarian, they're missional, they're theological assumptions, and they conclude with this. Let me now get to our definition of revival. Revival is when, by the Father's sovereign timing, Jesus extends his kingdom on earth by sending blessing and power to his church through the Spirit, so that the cross is preached, the church is made holy, and souls are saved in large number. That's my working definition. The others might add to it. They might use different wording. But for tonight, that is the conclusion of our theological assumptions. Revival then. Don't think of revival. We will not allow for any kind of definition or working assumption of revival where it replaces individual conversion. The cry of revival prayers is not, it is, it's just so boring when one gets saved and two get saved. And so what we want is revival instead of individual conversion. No, there's no such thing as revival without individual conversions. It's just individual conversions happening to a lot of people. Revival doesn't exist without individual conversion. It's not simply mass religious hysteria instead of the boring old conversion to Jesus Christ. It's the good old fact of conversion to Jesus happening en masse. Or as the Puritans called it, revival is gospel triumph. Gospel triumph. Let me tell you uh, in the sec second section of my talk tonight, why revival is a worthwhile topic for serious Christians to study. There are dangers 
if we decide to ignore revival or if we decide to not study revival, both in the Bible, in theology, and in history. I think there's risks if we do not do that. Some of the dangers are, first of all, that you will believe that revival, and whatever you hear about stories of revival, was some kind of unique circumstance that happened in sort of post-enlightenment, old colonial world between, you know, the UK, mostly the USA. It was really just the hype. It was the NFLization. It was the cheerleadering. It was, it was, it was the Americanization of Christianity. That's all that created revivals, right? The Americans, they ruined everything. Craig went there for a couple of years. He's come back ruined. No. <clears throat> You may think, there's an amen, there we go. <clears throat> you may think, if you don't study it properly, you'll be historically ignorant, biblically ignorant. Oh, a revival is that thing that happened under Edwards a couple of times, or under some of the charismatics who forced it to happen. No, and therefore, we have Dr. Craig here tonight, and thank you for being here, brother. Do you guys want to... There we go, thank you. And he's offering a biblical definition and precedent of revival. That's why it's worthwhile to study. If Another danger, if we don't study revival, is that you might believe the lie of modern secularists in Australia that Australian history has little to owe to evangelical Christianity. You may believe the lie that the Holy Spirit, much like modern historians, left Christian revival and influence right out of the Australian continent and nation. I would hate for you to believe that lie. And to combat that lie, we have Dr. Damon up from Tasmania here in our midst to give us a survey of historic Christianity as it unfolded in Australia through revivals. Thank you for being here, brother. <laughs> there he is. I found you eventually. I see that hand. Uh, if we do not study revival, we could also fall into the danger of believing that the solution to our nation's sorry moral state, anybody want to object to that, Australia's sorry moral state? Didn't think so. The, the solution to this state, you may be tempted to believe, lies in the effete endeavor called politics or, or education, when in truth, it lies in the power of the gospel to save people, then change people, and through them, renovate society. And speaking to that, we have Pastor Warren McKenzie in our midst, to, uh, who will be speaking to us tomorrow as well on that subject. Thanks for being here, brother. If we don't study revival, you might be surprised, no, you will be surprised, even if you do study revival, you're still surprised, by the kinds of phenomenon that occur in revival spiritual events or things or miracles or behavioral events of people doing things. And like too many Christians, you, you, you will be tempted to call for the water before the flames have even come up. Calm this all down. Stop it all before the, fire, the flames have even started. And so we have Pastor Giuliano from Grace Church who is going to be with, who is with us and will tomorrow speak about how to think about excessive occurrences in times of revival. Thanks for being here, brother. <laughs> here also is a danger, and I think there is some, a danger of studying revivals. Do you know that there is a danger in studying the events that God has poured out by His Spirit called revivals? If you study them, you may become so involved with them, you may study them so that you can recognize patterns, so that now you know how revivals happen, so that you can recreate them and reproduce them with extraordinary means. And so we have Pastor James McKenzie from Hope Gold Coast Church with us to speak tomorrow on the local church and revival. How and directing us in how to properly expect revival. Thank you for being here, Jimbo. <clears throat> Another danger of studying revival is that you might become fixated on the hype, on the ecstatic events that you read about in these amazing accounts. The storytelling, the narratives, the accounts of outpouring, the miracles that follow. You may be so excited by that, that that becomes what you seek. That is the power of salvation, and that is your uh, fixation. So let me offer this corrective right at the beginning of the conference. 
Revivals don't come because God's people fixate on previous events of revival. Revivals come when God's people fixate on the event of the cross of Jesus Christ. Where he who knew no sin was made sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's not preaching about revivals that the Spirit uses to bring life to the church and the world. It's preaching for revival, which means preaching about the atonement of the incarnated, perfect, crucified, resurrected, ascended, reigning, and soon returning Christ named Jesus, the Lord of all. It is about fixating on Him Preaching him, which is towards the end of revival, which is salvation. That's what brings revival, not preaching merely about exciting events of the past. What a trick, what a wily trick of the devil it would be to distract us from Jesus by fixating us on revivals. It would be like starving to death and bleeding internally in a restaurant because we devoured a plate after sweeping the main meal off. William G. Taylor said he was an Australian evangelist, and he said this back in the 1800s in among a revival that was taking place in Toowoomba, Queensland. He says, not only is it important that people cram the building, but more so that they themselves are crammed full of the glory of God in Christ. That's revival before many people in a building are. Let me speak to this uh, thought of why don't we have revival? Now, I'm, I'm no authority to speak on why Australia doesn't have revival. I don't have secret counsel with the triune God and his uh, secret decrees over all history, uh, much less am I no authority because... As far as I can tell, the biggest reason we don't have revival is standing inside this pulpit right now. I'm no authority to speak on all of the things that, that if you guys fixed up, then we'd have revival. But I want to try and speak in some measure to the topic of our context in Australia. Why is it that we don't see revival? I think essentially it is this. You need to know your state before you seek the cure. I think, by and large, the Australian church rushes to heal her wounds uh, gently, quickly, shallowly, without coming to a full diagnosis and understanding of her true sickness. That's why Jesus said to the church of Thyatira in Revelation 3, he says, you think yourselves uh, uh, rich and prospering, needing nothing, not realizing, actually, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Somebody should have told Jesus that that's not very Christ-like to preach like that to a church. But he exposed their need and then said, so I will give you, come to me and gain sight, clothing, healing, fullness. So the reasons we don't have revival, it might be said, are the same reasons we don't see our need for revival. I've got a few reasons, sort of, I've been thinking, mulling, reading, talking to some experts in the field over, uh, over phone calls and Zoom chats over the last few months, and here's some, some things that I, that I think stand out. They might sound surprising or maybe super basic. I hope they're helpful at least, though. The first, not in order, not, not, in, not in priority, but at least in my list tonight, the first reason that we don't see our need for revival, therefore don't seek revival and don't have it, is denominationism. Denominationism. That is, where every single local church belongs to some large, fast-moving machinery called a denomination with paid leadership and institutional prowess. And I've found so, very, anecdotally, I've found frequently Christian leaders might say things like this, uh, not in these words, but to effect, my church may be dead, we have had no conversions for multiple years, and I can't remember the last time somebody was baptized. But I'm assured that our movement has some real things going for it. 
Christians may be stingy, which is very unspiritual, so that their bills are not able to be paid, nor their pastors are uh, 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 paid for their wages, which is something that Paul says earns the wrath of God upon a people. When they do not treasure the preaching of the gospel enough to give enough among a congregation to meet a man's living, that earns God's wrath, Galatians 6. But instead of people feeling God's wrath, the denomination sends money, pays pastors, and looks after their bills. Stinginess, unspirituality, God's punishment, numbed. People could take or leave a church service, but, you know, that's not the important part. Every quarter, my denomination has an amazing conference with great speakers. It's like an image might be of a cemetery and it's really well organized and it's got great stone sculptures, but everything's dead. It's a well-organized, impressive, structured, dry bones institution. Often, denominationism numbs a church to its deadness. The second I would say is doctrinal ignorance. Doctrinal ignorance Friends, it's no good asking God to set a fire to the wood that revival would come from heaven, like Elijah praying that God's fire would come down and and set fire to the wooden altar uh, and the uh, the wood that there was to burn uh, with the cattle. It would be no good asking God to send fire, to set fire to the wood when what you actually have on the altar is styrofoam logs. This is how it is with many Christians who want revival. But what they mean is they want hype, they want excess, they want spirit, they want church growth, but their doctrinal knowledge cannot distinguish true wood from styrofoam painted. It is so shallow or sometimes outright heretical in their beliefs and they don't realize that if God did show up in flame, he would melt everything, then both the fire and the wood would be gone and there would be no lasting coals. How many Christians I've met Hungry for revival, good brothers and sisters that I appreciate, some of them even in ministry and teaching ministries who can't define justification. Paul has no category for that. Who don't really have an understanding of the law of God, who can't talk for more than a couple of seconds about the intricate details of the atonement, who have obviously no clue of hermeneutics and how to interpret scripture, just whack it open, say something about whatever's written there and and trust that God will send it, who have a poor uh, theology of the Holy Spirit. We need not all be doctors of theology. In fact, we don't any of us need to be that to see God's mighty work, but an untaught church is a bunch of dry bones like what Ezekiel saw in his vision in Ezekiel 37. And Stuart Piggin, an Australian historian and theologian, he, he uses this analogy of saying, but before Ezekiel was commanded to prophesy that the breath would come and fill all of the, the dead bodies in the valley, first he was looking at a bunch of dry skeletons, uh, bleached by the sun and dry, crumbling under a, a, a step upon them and crunching. And the first thing he was commanded to preach for, really, or prophesy, was reformation that all of the dry bones would find their proper spot, the sinews, the cartilage, the tendons, the muscles, the skin would come upon them, put everything in its right order, so that when the breath came, it did not simply pass through a bunch of dry bones, pick up a bunch of dust and move on to the next valley. It needed organs, it needed lungs, it needed capillaries, it needed a, a respiratory system, it needed a body, it needed a reformed sound body to then fill. And doctrinal knowledge is not simply for some academicians in a seminary somewhere. It is for every Christian to know the basics of the Bible teaching. Here's a third thing that is a hindrance to our revival, or something that numbs us to our need of revival, is pessimism. Theological, practical, gospel pessimism. We could just call this pride. Sometimes it's, it, it, it's, it, it's like this. We, and unlikely all of you, very unlikely many of you, in fact, will be saved. It is a sacrifice I'm willing to make. I've come to grips with it. Me and just a few. Expect no more. It's very unlikely to happen. You know how, you know how sinful mankind is. Sometimes this can come with the hyper-Calvinistic brand of pessimism. They have such a high view 
of total depravity and people's deadness that they can't really imagine many people being saved as if it wasn't an entire miracle from heaven that they got saved, that anybody gets saved. Sometimes it's in the brand of this, that the world is getting worse and history is trending downwards. Even so, if that's the case, isn't that all the more need for and all the more desirously uh, uh, pressing you to pray for revival? I don't see the logic there. Sometimes there's an obsession with the Antichrist and his powers instead of an obsession with the Christ and his power to save. This kind of pessimism, whichever it may be, numbs us to our need for revival because the smaller our churches and the more sinful the people around us and the fewer are saved, well, that just confirms what we expect to see. In fact, the less fruit we see in the Great Commission, we must be doing something right. Pessimism justifies and uh, uh, justifies value, we could say, and everything which should make us yearn for revival is numbed, and we tell ourselves, well, we're doing just fine. Isn't this what we expect to see? Few saved. Or maybe it's winsomeness. Winsomeness is what is a hindrance to revival. I don't read accounts of revival and see one person mightily used who was careful not to offend. Ever! Ever! When love from the world becomes more important than loving the world and them hearing about the fire of the gospel that saves them from the fire of hell, you cannot, you cannot, both, you cannot love the world properly as Christ calls us to if we want their love instead of giving them the gospel. This goes hand in hand with professionalism among pastors unwilling to embrace this ministry philosophy where we are merely fools for Christ without impressive systems, willing to plead, preach, and proclaim as messengers sent from heaven. Oh, it, it's just uncouth these days. We can be of no eternal benefit to anyone who we are trying to impress. Therefore, feckless, gutless, spineless leaders in evangelicalism who are unwilling to throw a spiritual punch right in the heat of the fight, they have in large measure led the flock of God in Australia astray. I think if we fail to reckon with these facts, we fail also to, re uh, to be able to come to a point of hoping for, desperately needing and expecting revival. Maybe all of those things could just be summed up by this. Our problem, why we don't see revival is our failure to reckon with what Paul said. That when he says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, he meant for us to unleash it with a grand expectancy of results. So our lack of faith in the gospel's power is our great hindrance to revival. That's why we intentionally chose Spurgeon's quote, which was featured on the website and is somewhat of a central thematic quote for this conference. When he said, I'm, I'm sure you've read it on the website, when the good old truth, that's the gospel in Spurgeon's language, by the way, when the good old truth of the gospel is once more preached by men whose lips are touched as with a live coal from off the altar, this shall be the instrument in the hand of the Spirit for bringing about a great and thorough revival of religion in the land. Re revival is nothing more, I could say, revival is nothing more than Jesus in his threefold office applying his mediatorial roles. In our Christology, as we think about Jesus, the theology of, of his ministry as our saviour, uh, Reformed theologians, uh, really starting with Calvin, kind of identified Jesus' may, uh, ministry in these three main ways that they looked at the Old Testament and said, of the anointed special ministers of God, there was the prophets who spoke for God, there was the priests who made sacrifices and prayed and rose their hands to bless the people, and there is the, the, the kings who ruled over and protected the people. And the book of Hebrews, starting in the first chapter, and all throughout the New Testament, once you see it, shows us that Jesus Christ is now the final and the greatest prophet, priest, and king for us. 
He speaks God's word to us by the Spirit. He offered the perfect sacrifice and now prays for us in heaven. He rules over us and puts down his enemies. Therefore, what revival is, is merely God in his threefold office, Christ in his threefold office, flexing, applying his mediation. It's Christ ruling from heaven, lifting his scepter as king in power. Revival is Jesus ministering from heaven, lifting his hands in blessing as priest. It is Jesus speaking from heaven, lifting his voice in command as prophet. Christ, in all of his new covenant glory, he is revival. The very first Christian minister to ever land and labor on Australian soil was a Methodist preacher who got here with the first fleet. He was a chaplain on board the ships, and then he was the chaplain or minister of religion here on this glorious, wonderful Southland. He was handpicked by John Newton. He was handpicked by William Wilberforce in England to go with the first fleet in order to be a missionary um, uh, service and a missionary uh, worker in this great new land that they then called either New Holland or New South Wales, the entire eastern portion of our continent. He was here from 1788, and he ended up leaving in 1800, too sick to continue his labor for many years, being the only minister on this uh, uh, country. He wrote back home after some people had written to him and, like, you know, diary of an, a sole pastor on an entire continent. They wrote back and said, well, we're organizing your trip home because obviously you're depressed and hate everything. And he wrote back a letter saying, oh, I didn't mean to sound like I wanted to leave. <laughs> so we don't, I don't have his ori original letter. It must have been pretty depressing. He was persecuted at all, at all corners. The, the, the government sends somebody secretly to actually burn down his church at some point, many think. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he wrote back and, 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 and says, no, no, I'm staying. I'm staying as long as God gives me the, the function to work and breath in my lungs. I'm staying here. But he says, I still have cause, of course, to lament and complain with Isaiah from his 59th chapter and verse 1 when he said, Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear. And he's saying, I'm still praying this in this country, I know. I'm complaining that it hasn't come to fruition, but, but he says, I hope and trust that I have not labored entirely in vain. And I trust in time, in spite of all opposition and obstacles, God will make bare his holy arm in the conversion and salvation of the souls of men. If we could speak to him, and in glory we will, if we could speak to him, we would say, you did not labor in vain to plant the gospel seed here. The church in Australia, as anywhere else, is indestructible as long as Christ is building her, despite all of the defenses that Satan's hellish gates put up. With Johnson, we pray that God would make bare his holy arm in our nation. This is what Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. The Presbyterians put together the Westminster Confession and they ask this question and they say, what are we even praying for in that second petition of the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. What are we praying for? And the answer is glorious. It's lengthy. Would you do your best to intrigue your mind and open your ears to hear it? In the second petition, it says, we are acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan. And therefore we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed. Amen, someone. That the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel ministers and ordinances and purged from corruption, so that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed in the world and made effectual to the converting of those that are still in their sins and the confirming, conforming, and building up of those that are already converted, 
so that Christ would rule in our hearts and hasten the time of His second coming and our reigning with Him and that He would be pleased so to exercise His kingdom power in history and all the world that may best conduce to these ends. I agree with the Presbyterians who wrote that. Jesus taught us to pray for revival. Spurgeon said, on Australia Day in 1860, I don't know if they celebrated Australia Day then, but on Australia Day in 1860, Spurgeon was preaching amidst revival in England. He was preaching on Amos 9.13. And he was speaking on that passage about the glorious effects of revival among a people and what you can expect to see. He says this, and I think if we catch what I've been trying to communicate tonight with God's help, if we catch that, then we can say with Spurgeon what he says here. God is about to send a time of surprising fertility to his church. When a sermon has been preached in these modern times, if one sinner has been converted by it, we have rejoiced with a suspicious joy. Ever have that in your church? Do you hear so-and-so has believed? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Let's just, let's just see how they, you know, will they last? I don't know. We'll see. If, probably not if that's you, if you're talking to them like that all the time. Uh, we, we, we rejoice by one conversion with a suspicious joy, Spurgeon says, for we have thought it something unbelievable. But brethren, where we have seen one converted, we may as well see hundreds. And where the word of God has been powerful to scores, it shall be blessed to thousands. And where hundreds in the past have seen it, nations shall be converted to Christ in the future. There is no reason why we should not see all the good that God has given and multiplied, that it should not be multiplied again a hundredfold. For there is sufficient life in the seed of the Lord to produce a far more plentiful crop than any we have yet gathered. God the Holy Ghost is not stinted in his power. Friends, the Holy Spirit doesn't lose power. The gospel seed of the word of God does not lose its power and the living Christ loses no power. Let me to close by reading what William G. Taylor said about this glorious, he describes the landscape, it sounds like heaven on earth. What's it, what's it called? A town called Brisbane. Are you familiar with that? Uh, William G. Taylor in the 1870s was a revivalist missionary. He went to Toowoomba, he went to Warwick, he came to Brisbane. He says this, gradually, this is, I'm coming in halfway through his amazing story, gradually the work spread. At South Brisbane, the front pew at church was filled with penitent souls at every Sunday night service. The meetings were frequently marked by a truly Pentecostal influence. He means Acts 2, not the denomination. Uh, a true Pentecostal influence. There was no attempt. I love this. There was no attempt to get up a revival. They didn't try to make a revival. There was no attempt to get up a revival. It simply came down. And in such a fashion that people from far and near came to see Jesus. Isn't that a witness to a revival? When people don't come to see the worship, the falling, the yelling, the preacher, or the revival itself, they're coming to see Jesus. He says Albert Street, and then Fortitude Valley, the churches in the city, uh, the only other Methodist church in the city, they soon caught the flame. It mattered little who was the preacher, praise God. It mattered little who was preaching. The power of God was present to heal souls. Necessity compelled us to arrange for extended prayer meetings every week, which went on week after week for nearly four months. Soon, we had the joy of seeing over 400 who had professed faith in Jesus Christ. And after a lifetime of Methodist missionary work, he writes in his journal, All my life I have lived in the midst of revival work, but never have I witnessed a more scriptural, more deep, more permanent work of God than this in our city. Friends, if there is no precedent for revival in our past in Australia, or if it is found to be filled with it, if it's a deeply Christianized nation or we are entirely heathen, 
nothing changes the prospect for the church because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is the power of revival. I want to pray as we close. Oh God, we want you to do this sort of thing again. Not for the event's sake, but for Jesus' sake. We want the gospel preached, the cross extolled, Jesus worshipped, and souls to come flooding to him. Lord, our first step must be to acknowledge that we desperately need it, and we would be so arrogant. I would be so arrogant to assume that we wouldn't have to change anything were you to send this. God, each one of us in some measure stands in the way and we ask that you would change us to make us ready to see your grand work of glorifying Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, what you taught us to pray in Psalm 46 verse 10, that we should be still and know that you are God. You will be exalted among the nations and you will be exalted in the earth. Praise you, Lord God. Amen.